In the last video, we looked at what happens after fertilization and up until the point where the blastocyst implants itself into the uterine wall or into the endometrium. So we had the blastocyst implanting somewhere here. Um, then that blastocyst will develop, it will continue undergoing mitosis, producing more and more cells to form an embryo. Now, in this next video, we're going to transfer between the term embryo or fetus because both actually are applicable in this case because this will happen for nine months, everything we look at today, the role of the placenta, the umbilical cord and all of that. So it happens when it's just an embryo for the first 12 weeks and then after 12 weeks when it is now a fetus, it is still continuing to happen. So this is the structure of the womb when it is um, developing a baby or an embryo. And we look at some structures called extra embryonic membranes here. Now, extra embryonic membranes means it's outside of the embryo. So they are surrounding the embryo. We just have two extra embryonic membranes. We have the outermost membrane that is called the chorion. So that's the outer amniotic membrane. And it also forms these structures here that are embedded into the uterine wall. And those structures are called chorionic villi. Be careful here you don't use the word chronic villi. Um, I think in some textbooks that it is spelt incorrectly, but also just chorionic sounds like a funny word. So we have to say chorionic villi. And it's the same structure... Um, Physically, when we look at it here as a villus in the small intestine, it's a finger-like projection and it increases surface area. But the chorionic villi helps to form the placenta. So the placenta is the chorionic villi plus the endometrium. So it's part of the baby and part of the mother. The next membrane that we look at is the amnion. So that is inside the chorion. And the amnion is the inner amniotic membrane, which contains amniotic fluid. So we all have heard about an amniocentesis, where fluid from around the embryo or fetus is removed and analyzed for any genetic abnormalities. That's how they diagnose Down syndrome. So we, we've heard of amniotic fluid. So it does make sense that the amnion is the membrane that is enclosing the amniotic fluid. Now, the amniotic fluid has some very important functions. Um, very importantly, it uh, pr acts as a shock absorber. So it protects that fetus from any kind of mechanical injury. So if the mother bumps her stomach or takes a small fall, it does give the fetus some kind of protection against um, that mechanical injury. It also prevents the dehydration of the embryo. So it needs to be enclosed in a fluid. The Fluid also makes sure that the fetus remains in a small temperature range. So if the mother goes into a cold room like the fridge or a walk-in fridge, then the fetus won't get too cold. It won't be affected by that change in temperature. Um, two other functions that are maybe not mentioned in your textbook. It allows for free fetal movement, which will promote skeletal development. So the fetus can kind of swim around in there. Um, and it is relatively free fetal movement, but it's not protection. It doesn't give protection from anything because that free fetal movement is important that it is able to develop skeletal to muscle tone. And the last thing is it allows the fetus to practice the swallowing reflex. So later on in the gestation period, you can see on um, scans that the fetus is practicing swallowing and then spitting out that fluid that is in its mouth. So it is ready to swallow when it is born. Um, the last lab two labels here that we're going to look at is the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord is what allows the fetus to be connected to the mother. And it contains an umbilical artery and an umbilical vein. So the blood is going in both directions. And last thing, the placenta, it's where the embryo is connected to the mother and it's made up of, like I said, the chorionic villi, which is part of the child or the baby, and the endometrial tissue. So it's this whole structure over here would be the placenta. So it's the structure where those chorionic villi are embedded into the uterine wall. And that's the placenta, which would be shed after birth as what we consider the afterbirth. 
just to point out that this is one of those very important diagrams that you could be asked to label and then give functions of the parts. But we're going to look at the placenta in a little bit more detail. Okay, so the placenta, remember, like I said, is this part over here where the baby's tissue is coming into contact or the baby's blood is coming into contact with the mother's blood. Um, so we've zoomed in on this little section here. So there's a little portion of the umbilical cord there, and that's that portion of the umbilical cord. This is the chorion, the outer membrane here, and these are the extensions of the chorion, the chorionic villi. So that's where the baby or the fetus's um, tissue stops. And this all contains fetal blood. So firstly, we need to look at the functions of the placenta. Um, they're not too challenging. Some of them make actually perfect sense. So the main thing is it makes sure the embryo or the fetus remains attached to the mother. Without the the chorionic villi being embedded in the endometrium, the fetus would very easily just be shed at an early stage. Um, it also allows for the diffusion of useful substances like dissolved food and oxygen from mother to fetus. So the fetus obviously isn't eating. It is relying on the mother's intake of food and the mother's digestive system to then have the dissolved glucose, amino acids, all of that, and oxygen in her blood, and then when it comes into close contact with the fetus's blood, it will diffuse those nutrients across and then enter the fetus. Obviously, then it goes the other way as well. The fetus will produce nitrogen excretory waste or nitrogenous excretory wastes and carbon dioxide through cellular respiration, so it needs to get rid of that, and that's also the job of the placenta. It allows the diffusion check the direction though from fetus to mother so the mother will be excreting her fetus's waste as well as her own and the last function is actually that the the placenta is able to produce its own progesterone um, now just a reminder that progesterone's job is to maintain pregnancy so once the corpus luteum has been formed the corpus luteum is producing progesterone and after 12 weeks, the placenta will start to produce its own progesterone to ensure that that progesterone secretion is high enough. And that will make sure that the endometrium remains nice and thick and vascular and glandular so that the placenta remains combined or attached. So let's have a look at the structure here. It isn't easy to understand. There is a paragraph in your textbook on it, but it doesn't have the um, diagram, which I find much more helpful. So as the um, fetus is developing, we end up, or as women, we end up producing blood-filled spaces called sinuses, and they're filled with maternal blood. So they're kind of just hollowed out areas that have free-flowing blood in it. So this is the structure, this beige yellow color is what we call a maternal sinus, which is just a hollow space in the endometrium filled with maternal blood. And that blood, like I said, is free flowing. It's not in arteries and veins. You can see here that the maternal blood vessels is releasing. They are releasing their blood into the sinus. So this is maternal blood entering the space. Here you can see maternal blood leaving the space. Now the chorion, which is this membrane here, ends up extending into this maternal sinus to form chorionic villi. I see in your textbook that they actually do spell it chronic villi on page 57. So make sure you correct that to chorionic villi. It's on the last words on that first bullet point. So these chorionic villi will have blood vessels of the fetus that are continuous with the umbilical artery and umbilical vein. So what happens is this maternal blood will have a large amount of dissolved foods and oxygen and a small amount of carbon dioxide and waste products. So that means that through diffusion at the chorionic villi, that blood, those um, dissolved nutrients and oxygen can diffuse into the chorionic villi and therefore into the umbilical vein eventually. So the umbilical vein's job is very important. You must know this. It carries blood which is oxygenated and has dissolved food in it from mother to fetus. So it's a little bit 
confusing because I kind of think about it as the vein goes in, the vein goes into the fetus. But I think it then messes with our um, mind in terms of the veins go into the heart. And now you're thinking, well, which heart? But in this case, it's going towards the fetus's heart. Or you can say into the fetus. Whereas the umbilical artery, on the other hand, carries blood away from the fetus. And that blood will contain um, carbon dioxide, so it is deoxygenated, and a lot of nitrogenous waste. And that blood will therefore enter the chorionic villi and those waste products will diffuse into the maternal sinus so they will leave the fetus's blood and they will eventually travel out of the placenta and the mother will excrete it it's important to see here that the fetus's blood and the maternal blood which is in this beige space are in very close contact to each other they just separated by the membrane of the chorionic villi but that's the only thing separating maternal and fetal blood so diffusion is over a relatively short and thin distance